I don't like sand. It gets everywhere. Walking into a movie theater often proves to be, a, you know, a bit disappointing for those of us in the film and video world. It's kind of like a musician going to see the Black Eyed Peas in concert. Is it entertaining? Yeah, sure. But, you know, is it good and inspiring and, like, good? Big words. As filmmakers, content creators, and editors, we're always looking for something more than just entertaining. Just like musicians feel when they hear that perfect technical execution of complex chord progressions, that's how we feel when that shot is just right in a movie. Just like musicians find meaning and purpose in the chaos of jazz, we too can see through the complex stories and marvel at the editing prowess of those who made it. It's not that we don't enjoy Marvel movies or just fun summer blockbuster movies with cheesy storylines. How are you gonna kill it? Evolution. I'm gonna make this thing bleed. But in a profession where we're desperately searching for something deeper or something, something out there to inspire us, we experience something more profound than entertainment or enjoyment when we come across a film or video that immerses us and kind of takes us by surprise. And that was the case with Everything Everywhere All at Once, a movie about the multiverse, which seems to be a hot topic right now. Spiraling through the multiverse, burping semi-improvised dialogue about how nothing matters. Going into it, I just, you know, expected another typical sci-fi action movie that would be a fun watch, but wouldn't do anything extremely different from any other movie in the genre, like how a lot of movies are these days, right? But I mean, this movie had it all from a unique story with excellent filmmaking and special effects work, a great cast and just visually impressive. I'll admit I knew very little about this movie before I went in to see it and I was really surprised afterward to learn that it only had a $25 million budget for a movie that had, I would say, Marvel level effects and graphics. And not only that, they only had a five man team for 500 visual effects shots, which is absolutely insane. This brings us to the question of how do they achieve a movie like this on what's pretty much a shoestring budget in today's world? Well, they did something right that most of the video and film industry constantly gets wrong. Somewhere along the way, we lost our creative ingenuity in making movies and creating content. If you look around the industry, everything has become such a cookie cutter process, copying one thing and replicating it somewhere else. A glaring example is the, you know, specific franchise that I'm sure you've never heard about that constantly gets picked on. Which, you know, many times feels like studio executives get in the way of good storytelling, minus maybe the Batman, which just came out. In the corporate world, your typical production house just pumps out the same lifeless, formulaic content for everyone, making you feel triggered anytime you hear music like this. Can we just vote on, you know, killing the corporate music genre in general? All of that mess is what Everything Everywhere All at Once, an indie film, was free from. And really that let the director, Daniel Kwan, and Daniel Shiner pull from their personal style of storytelling to make this movie. The Daniels, as they like to call themselves, got their start making music videos and working on extremely tight deadlines to get videos done. So, you know, they were used to being intimately involved in every part of the production, even doing a lot of visual effects work themselves. Over the 10 years of doing music videos and working on indie films, they gained a lot of experience, practical, special, effects puppets, <laughs> which were all used in this film and really added to the character of it. Zach Stoltz, a visual effects artist who worked with the Daniels for years, explained in an interview with Wired that the core thing we all realized as we were doing visual effects on the Daniels film is that it really needed to stay grounded in what's going on in the story. The visual effects work should never overtake that. And in seeking how to do this on a minimal budget, they took inspiration from one of the first sci-fi movies, A Trip to the Moon, made in 1902. One of the visual effects elements that stood out to them was a jump cut to smoke. So they use that all over the place in the film, saying that they got to cheat because they have After Effects in the modern world, which crazy enough was the primary effects program used for this entire movie, as that's what they were most familiar with pretty cool. Also, not only did they just use After Effects, they also used some interesting technical camera work that helped to speed up some of the visual effects processes. One scene involved a main character traveling through hundreds of multiverse universes. And with each of these universes, they needed footage that, you know, to be used to show the character traveling through them. So Daniel Kwan actually took, as he says, a pocket camera that shoots 4K, which, uh, you know, kind of uh, which sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it, to uh, Blackmagic fans? And 
he would take this camera with him everywhere and filmed with a slow shutter to make it super blurry and then took all that footage and got the actress to act in front of a green screen and as they called it, you know, a 99 cent LED screen so the actor could react to the footage at the same time. Kind of like the Mandalorian, but the 99 cents version of that. In post, they added as many elements to sell the motion as they could from barely visible anime streaks, glass that would shatter, kind of any particles that would help sell the movement and craziness of the shot. So most of the visual effects in the movie were simple. You could do most of this movie at home if you had enough time. Daniel Kwan kind of sums up their experience making this movie saying it really, really is about all the story. 500 visual effects shot done with five guys done in their bedroom during the pandemic and you know, they're not perfect, but they work and they're beautiful because they have their own unique style. We need to be encouraging other independent filmmakers to understand this language because this is how all movies are going to be made now. There's always going to be some element of visual effects, even when you can't tell. It has become so easy and effortless to use. So what should you take away from all of this? I... I think that we get so overwhelmed at times by all the different skills we think we need to learn and improve on to be successful in this industry and that we don't take time to go back and really learn the principles of filmmaking, to go back and find something as simple as a jump cut from a movie in 1902 and see how we can use that in the modern age to, you know, to a greater effect. Most of our industry will just throw money at the wall until something sticks, thinking that that's the best way to make good films or content. But like, aren't you concerned about the amount of money Amazon is spending on that Lord of the Rings series? I don't really hear that and think, oh, wow, that's going to be automatically the best series ever because they spent the most money ever making it. Money. More. With more money comes more oversight. With more oversight comes muddied creative vision. And with less clear vision, you get mediocre content at best. But I'm also a big fan of justice. You know, there's a reason you go watch a Christopher Nolan movie and get your mind blown. There's a reason why you go watch a Jordan Peele movie and leave the theater questioning your life. There's a reason why you can watch a Matt Reeves movie and like it. And when you watch a Roland Emmerich movie, you get... <laughs> Okay, Moonfall, which I guess is a great example of why you have executive overreach. That movie was just awful. Can you believe they wanted to make that into a franchise like Star Wars? Nah. Point of this being, don't let the thought that you don't have enough funding, money, equipment, experience, or the right skill sets keep you from trying to achieve your creative vision. Sometimes tight-knit, ragtag groups, like the team that made Everything Everywhere all at once can achieve what big studios and corporate production houses cannot. Good content and stories. So at the end of the day, take that time to go back and learn about the history of film and the video industry and find things that they've done in the past that, you know, maybe you could rework and make to work for yourself. But again, go out there, try things. Don't let where you're at right now keep you from learning and trying to achieve bigger things in the future. And just realize that all the different random skills that you're learning now, even if you're just a freelancer, can equal into something greater in the future. And you know, talking about all this money and all this stuff spent, you know how much money spent on airy cameras? A lot. And I'm sure all of us would love to use them. But even if you never get to use them. Here's why you should study Airy. If you're a film or even if you're just doing corporate client work, it's a really good place to ground yourself. Watch this video. You won't regret it. Or you might. Who knows?